Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. in the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson. At that broad expansion of the river, denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators, the Tapon Sea, and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed. There lies a small market town or rural port which by some is called Greensburg, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Tarrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. Be that as it may, I do not vow for the fact, but merely advert to it, for the sake of being precise and authentic. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley, or rather lap of land, among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole small brook glides through it with just murmur enough to lull one to repose, and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon uniform tranquility. I recollect that when a stripling, my first exploit in squirrel shooting was in a grove of tall walnut trees that shades one side of the valley. I had wandered into it at noontime, when all nature is peculiarly quiet, and was startled by the roar of my own gun. 
as it broke the Sabbath stillness around and was prolonged and reverberated by the angry echoes. If I ever should wish for a retreat, whither I might steal from the world and its distractions and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know none more promising From the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered clan has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country, a drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others, that an old Indian chief prophet or wizard of his tribe held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Hendrick Hudson. Certain it is, the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual they are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight. Stars shoot, and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country, and the nightmare, with her whole ninefold, seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambles. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted and seems to be commanded in chief of all the powers of the air, is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannon in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads, and especially the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts, who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning the spectre, allege that the body of the trooper, having been buried in the churchyard, ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head, and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Such 
is the general purport of this legendary superstition, which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadow, and the specter is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. It is remarkable that the visionary propensity I have mentioned is not confined to the native inhabitants of the valley, but is unconsciously imbibed by everyone who resides there for a time, however wide awake they may have been before they entered that sleepy region. They are sure in a little time to inhale the witching influence of the air and begin to grow imaginative, to dream dreams. mention this peaceful spot with all plausible blood, for it is in such little retired Dutch valleys, found here and there embosomed in the great state of New York, that population, manners, and customs remain fixed, while the great torrent of migration and improvement, which is making such incessant changes in other parts of this restless country, sweeps by them unobserved. They are like those little nooks of still water which border a rapid stream, where we may see the straw and bubble riding quietly at anchor slowly revolving in their mimic harbor, undisturbed by the rush of the passing current. Though many years have elapsed since I trod the drowsy shades of Sleepy Hollow, yet I question whether I should not still find the same trees and the same family vegetating in its sheltered bosom. In this by-place of nature there abode, in a remote period of American history, that is to say some thirty years since, a worthy white of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or as he expressed it, Buried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity. He was a native of Connecticut, a state which supplies the union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest, and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier and country schoolmasters. The cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. He was tall, but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovel and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging 
and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth where some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old copybooks. It was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a wise twist in the handle of the door and stakes set against the window shutter so that, though it thief get in with perfect ease, he would find some embarrassment in getting out. An idea most probably borrowed by the architect, Jost van Holden, from the mystery of an eelpot. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation. running close by, and a formidable birch tree growing at one end of it. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices conning over their lessons might be heard in a drowsy summer's day like the hum of a beehive. Interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master in the tone of menace or command or peradventure, by the appalling sound of the birch as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man ever bore in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod and spoil the child. He could but crane scholars certainly were not spoiled. I would not have imagined it, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity, taking the burden off the backs of the weak and laying it on those of the strong. Your mere puny stripling that wins the least flourish of the rod was passed by with indulgence, but the claim 